Hi, how's it going? In this video, we're going to be looking at recording label agreements and contracts. So I'm going to take you through what the agreement is and the main clauses that you should have a basic understanding of as an independent artist. So let's start at the beginning. What is a recording contract? So to really kind of understand this, you probably need to know what a recording label is and what it actually does. So a record label is an organization or a company that makes money from recorded music. So I just want to separate something out for independent artists that they need to understand is that this is nothing to do with your songs. This is just the recordings of your songs. Your songs are taken care of separately, usually by a publisher. If you don't have a publisher, then you'll be taken care of by yourself. The record label is separate. It's just for the recorded music only. So a record label contract is where you are agreeing with a label about the ownership, rights and income relating to your recordings. So now you're going to need to understand about the ownership and rights of your recordings if you're going to understand what the contract is. Essentially, it's about the ownership of your final recordings, your masters. Usually, whoever pays to have the recordings made is the person who owns the recording, who owns the copyright. Now, most independent artists tend to fund their own recordings. So let's use that as our starting point. So you've got your recordings, you've paid for them, you own the recordings and you own the copyright on those recordings. And remember, this has nothing to do with the song. You could have made a cover version of somebody else's song. They'll still own the song, you'll own the copyright on the recording. Okay, This is about the recording only, not the song. Now, as the owner of the recording and therefore the recording copyright, you get certain automatic rights to the recording. This means that no one really can do anything without your permission. That sounds great, but in reality, you want people to do things with your recordings. You want them to distribute them and market them and help you promote them and, and so on. So you're going to need to find a way of granting them these permissions so that they can help you. And that is kind of essentially what the recording agreement is about. It's a way that you can give someone some permissions and they can therefore invest their time and sometimes some money and you can split the future income with them in some way and you can find an agreement for that to be achieved. The other thing that you need to know is what are we talking about when we say recording income? Probably the best way to think of this is as there's two different parts to it. One is your sales and streaming downloads, that kind of income, usually the money that you'll get from a distributor. The other part is your copyright royalty income. And that tends to be collected by an organization for you. In the UK, we have PPL. In the US, there's Sound Exchange. Different countries, different territories have a different version of this. So there's two types of the recording income, okay? Let's call them sales income and copyright royalty income. So now you know what a recording agreement is all about, let's have a little look at some of the actual main clauses that you're going to encounter. Before we get into that though, just a quick disclaimer, this is not legal advice for you on any specific contract, okay? I'm not trying to help you make a legal decision here. This is just for information purposes so that you're armed with some knowledge and understand what is going on around you. So let's start right at the beginning, at the top of a document that you're going to see will be the title of what it is. And sometimes even this can be confusing because it's not necessarily just called recording contract. Sometimes they might call it something like deal terms or heads of terms, these kinds of things. Usually that means that it's a slightly shorter version of what could become a fuller contract if both parties wanted to negotiate something bigger further down the line. But either way, if you've got a load of clauses set out before you, and you're expected to sign at the end of it, your agreement, you should assume that you are entering into a legally binding contract with somebody. Now, the next thing to point out is that there are kind of two main types of agreements that you might see from a label. So we'll start with the first one, which is really, well, most people tend to call it a distribution deal. Now you may think, well, I can just distribute myself. I'm just, you know, I can just go to CD Baby or DistroKid or one of these kind of companies and just put my music out. Why do I need a label? Well, the idea is that the label is going to help market and promote you and pitch you and, and you've got all their promotional channels. That's, that's the idea of it. Sometimes they might give you a little bit of money as well, but often these types of distribution label deals mainly focused on them helping you promote and market yourself. So generally this type of label distribution deal 
is usually short term, maybe for a few singles, perhaps an EP, one album, that kind of thing. And they don't collect your copyright royalty income. They're only going to collect your distribution income. OK, so what's called the neighboring rights that stays with you, the artist, and you will still need to collect your own rights income through PPL, Sound Exchange, wherever it may be, as I mentioned earlier. The other type of label agreement is probably more the thing that most people think of when they hear a recording contract. And that is where the label collects all of your recording income, including your copyright royalty income. And in that scenario, there will be something in the contract where you have granted them permissions, even if it's temporary, for them to have use of your recording copyright in some way or another. This leads us straight into what is likely to be one of the first clauses that you're going to see in this kind of contract. And this is where the label sets out how you are going to allow them some kind of a permission to use your copyright. And the way that they do this is they request you to license your copyright to the recordings over to them for a short period of time. I guess you can probably think of the word licensing as a type of short term borrowing or short term loan. That's kind of what it is. So the label is going to be getting permission from you to kind of have some control over your copyright for whatever set period of time that you agree. After that point, those rights come straight back to you and you will control them again. If you see the words assign or assignment of your copyrights over to the label, that's different. That means that essentially they are taking complete control and ownership permanently for those recording copyrights. Okay, you'll never see them again. They are gone for good. So avoid assignment at all costs or certainly don't ever sign any kind of assignment of your rights over to anybody without a music lawyer looking at it first. Okay, so generally speaking, it's far more popular these days to see licensing deals. That's what most people are doing. Then next, the agreement is going to say most likely that it's exclusive. Now, that can mean one of two things. It could mean that the tracks that are related and specified in this contract are exclusive with that label. So therefore, you can't then go and do another deal on those exact same tracks anywhere else. Although you could do a deal on other tracks, different tracks that you might have, you might want to put out with another label. But with those tracks mentioned in this specific contract, you can't do anything else with them. It's exclusive with them. Or what it could mean is that you, the artist, are exclusive with the label. And therefore, for a set period of time, you can't do any other type of deal with another label. OK, so they kind of secured you as well as the tracks. So just be careful uh, what exclusivity it is that you are actually agreeing to. Next in the contract, you're going to find a clause or maybe even a series of clauses relating to the term. So when you see the phrase term, that just means a set period of time that you're agreeing with the label that something is going to last, whether that's your exclusivity with the label, how long they can hold on to the license for maybe these kinds of things. You may also see something called an exploitation period um, or that kind of language. And that may be that even though part of a term might finish and some of the rights may come back to you or you can go on and do other things, you may be released from the contract in some way. It may be that they still retain some kind of right to collect certain income, usually the distribution income, so that they can therefore keep spreading the risk that they've taken of getting involved with you or putting money into the project right at the beginning. So usually a label wants as long term as possible and an artist wants it to be as short as possible. That's pretty much a key negotiation point with most of these deals. The next key clause is often called the delivery or your commitment. And this is basically the delivery that you have to do and what you're committing. So this is usually where it specifies the music that this contract is all about. So it may even list the titles of the tracks even, or it might just say it's a six track EP and the titles to be decided. Usually this will encompass any remixes or bonus tracks that you do and uh, any audio visuals, so any, any videos that accompany any of the songs that will usually fall under this contract as well. Sometimes also a label may want the option of continuing the agreement with you into your future tracks even. So although it may specify in the contract that you have now that they just want for one EP and they list the tracks, it may also say but they want an option of your second EP as well. And that way they're sort of you know edging their bets and they could get a chance to help release and profit from your next EP as well. Usually speaking, this is all on their terms and it's not it's not an option for you. 
you're kind of tied in, but it's just if they want to continue with you. Now, in addition to you having a delivery and a commitment to the label, the label also needs to make a commitment to you in return. So this is usually called something like a release commitment. And you really want to make sure this is in any label contract if you're ever going to sign one. Okay. This is where they guarantee to you that if you sign the tracks over to them, they will release them commercially for you within a set period of time. And you may think, well, why would a label not release my tracks? Well, there's a variety of different reasons. I won't list them all because it's, it's not worth it. But just understand that sometimes that can happen for whatever reason. So let's move on and have a little look at the money side of things. If a label is going to be giving you any money at all up front, then they're going to have clauses in the contract that set out what it is they're giving you and the reasons why they're giving it to you. So there could be a few different reasons why they give it to you. It might just be an advance on your future earnings, or it might be that they want you to spend it on marketing in some way. And usually it might have language like it's a marketing contribution, that kind of thing. Okay, so they could just work out what it is they're giving you and why uh, they're giving it to you and what they expect you to spend it on. Okay, and if a label is giving you any money up front, then they are going to be expecting that back from your future income. Okay. You may have heard of the word recoup and recouping. Well, that's what that means. So they've given you anything up front, they will recoup this out of your future share of the income. So there's no free money from labels, okay? It's all your money, essentially. You're just getting it a little bit earlier. That's all it means. Then with regards to the income that the label are making, you need to have an agreement with them on how much of the income they get to keep and how much they then need to pay on to you, okay? So this is your split your revenue share, your royalty, that kind of language it changes from contract to contract as to what they call it. But this is where you agree your split, basically. This is usually done as a percentage. They'll usually say something like it's net receipts, so which is kind of the money that comes in, less a few costs, and then you're agreeing the split of what that money is after that. Then next, you might see a request for the rights to sync your music or to sell your recordings for sync. That means like to be used in film, TV, adverts, that kind of thing. Now, you'll see this if it's not a licensing deal. So if it's just like a distribution type label agreement with them, then they'll need this extra right from you, this permission from you to be able to do that. Generally speaking, you're going to want to let them do this. That's fine. If it's a license agreement or you know, or bigger agreement with, with a major company, then you're already giving them the license to do this. So they don't need to request it separately from you. They've basically got the license to do whatever they need to do to maximize the commercial potential of that music. Then you're going to see a whole load of various sort of standard clauses um, in the contract, such as accounting, which will explain how frequently you're going to get paid by the label. You also want to make sure you've got something called a right to audit, which allows you to inspect the label's accounts and books if you feel they're not paying you properly. Uh, you should see clauses about termination. This is ways that you can end the contract for various reasons. If they haven't done something that they need to do or they've broke contracts in some way or another, how do you end it, the relationship, and move on? You'll also see something called jurisdiction. So this is where the contract will specify uh, the legal authority that the agreement will fall under. So generally speaking, you kind of want your own country's jurisdiction. So if you're an English artist, ideally, you want the jurisdiction of the English courts. That way, if there's a dispute, you can use English courts and English lawyers and your contract will fall under English law. If it says it's under US jurisdiction and you're uh, an English artist, then if you have a dispute, you then have to go to the US courts and probably hire a US lawyer because laws are slightly different in every country and that's going to be more expensive. So ideally, you want it to be in your own country. So those are the main elements of a recording agreement. Now, the label may want additional things from you. So they may want to get involved in your live income or your merchandise income. They might even want to manage you, all these kinds of things. Obviously, this is all going to cost you more money and allow them to collect more income from what you're doing and your activities. You may have heard of something called 360 deals. They were quite popular for a while, but that was basically where the labels are trying to get involved in kind of all aspects of an artist's income. You may even get requested for um, them to get involved in your publishing. They may want to try and do the publishing for you as well so they can therefore start um, 
earning money from your songs. Okay, I know I mentioned earlier that recording contracts is just the, on your recording income, but they may actually specify they want to um, start doing your publishing for you as well. So generally speaking, I'd resist that if I could. From an artist point of view, you only want them involved in your recording income and none of the other stuff. You kind of want to manage all that yourself or with other other team players and other partners and partner up with people who are involved in that industry. So it kind of depends on the deal and who it is that's doing it. What are they actually bringing to the table? Are they actually someone that's got any experience in publishing or are they just trying to do a land grab and get as much as they want? Again, it depends on the organization, depends on the situation, depends on the deal. Generally speaking, a label will want as much as possible for as long as possible and an artist wants to give them as little as possible for as short time as possible. That's generally how it works and negotiation happens in between. But also do try and see this from the label's point of view. So I don't want to try and portray the label as being like greedy and just wants to take as much as they can because actually that's not really the case. I'm just trying to show you what their point of view is and what your point of view should be and why that negotiation in between those two points happen. Okay, most labels don't tend to just put down a big greedy land grab like that. They tend to put across a fair agreement. I know lots of label owners and most of them are lovely, genuine people who are just in it for the love of music. Clearly they're trying to run a business and make a profit, but it's they're not trying to rip people off. They're not sharks. They do exist though. There are contracts that are like that and I have seen some that are just ridiculous. I'm like, there's no way we can agree to that. So, you know, you just need to kind of think about what it is and who you're doing business with. You know, is it someone that you feel you can trust and work with? Can you find something in between a negotiation that you can come to an arrangement and you can work together to try to achieve something that's, you know, commercially successful for both parties? That's what you're trying to do here. Now, I just want to make one final disclaimer here before we finish this video, okay? Please seek legal advice of your own if you're going to sign any kind of significant agreement with a label. All right, I'm not a lawyer. I'm an artist manager and an artist coach. So I've negotiated loads of contracts for our artists and help artists sign contracts. Sometimes I've used lawyers, sometimes I haven't. Okay, You need to use a lawyer if you're going to sign a contract. There's another reason why you want to use a lawyer, and that is because they know all the deals that are going on out there. They know which terms are good. They know what sort of a modern deal is starting to look like. They even know most of the labels and some of the contacts at these labels. Okay, so they are plugged into that world for you. Okay, so really, I recommend that you use a lawyer. Can't stress that enough. Just to point out as well, if you are do, doing a deal with a label and there's money on the table, usually speaking, it's quite common that the label will pay for your lawyer. Okay, so therefore you haven't got to find the legal fees up front. But do be aware that although they're going to pay for your lawyer, that's going to be part of the money that they'll recoup back from you from your future earnings. Now, I hope that's been really helpful for you. I hope that kind of gives you an understanding and helps you to sort of arm yourself and understand what's going on around you. Okay, best of luck with it all out there and we'll see you next time.